Academia has fallen. Let me explain. So you're Francesca Gino, an award-winning scientist and a professor at one of the most prestigious universities in the world, Harvard. As a professor, you do not care about making money as much as, say, business people. No one goes into teaching or science for the money, but you are still human, and what you do care about is your status. And how do you increase your status as a professor scientist? Well, as a professor scientist at a prestigious university like Harvard, people expect you to be making super big discoveries. Super big discoveries that change the way we see the world. Super big discoveries that happen to make Harvard look good. And that also happen to land you more publicity, book deals, interviews, awards, and admiration. The only problem is revolutionary scientific discoveries are pretty hard to come by. Many scientists go their entire careers without making a single groundbreaking discovery. And even those that do only get the chance once or twice in their lifetime. But you're desperate. You want to be remembered as one of the best scientists of our time. So you hatch up a little plan to fudge the numbers a little bit, to change some of the numbers here and there, to make it seem like your studies are far more shocking and revolutionary than they really are. As a celebrated academic, no one's ever going to suspect you of committing fraud. And plus, as the lead researcher in these studies, committing fraud is so easy. The temptation is hard to resist. And so you allegedly fudge the numbers, never expecting that you'll get caught. But eventually you did. Professor Francesca Gino has been officially accused of faking the results in at least four of her studies. These studies have been referenced in books by famous authors, by companies in their marketing strategies, they've influenced an entire community of scientists and researchers, and they've changed the way we understand human behavior. And in the academic world, these studies have earned Francesca celebrity status. But as it turns out, it was all based on lies. And it gives us an inside look on just how corrupt science has become. Stay dangerous and this is the fall of academia. When you're in a classroom setting like a university, or you're in your workplace, or you're going for a run, oftentimes you want to listen to music. But with traditional earphones, you won't be able to hear the car that's about to hit you, or you won't hear your colleagues trying to tell you something. And then boom, you get hit by a car. Well, not anymore thanks to shocks. Shocks are these professional, open-ear, truly wireless earbuds that are shockingly good. Unlike traditional earphones, shocks have this open ear design, so not only can you hear every single little thing around you, but they're also infinitely more comfortable. Even with AirPods, my ears still get sore after only a few hours. But with shocks, you can truly wear them all day without any strain. When I first got these, I was really nervous about how they would sound, but I was genuinely surprised at how good they sound and how punchy the bass is. The quality really does sound on par compared to normal earphones. The one I have is their open fit model, and they are now my go-to earbuds when I go running because they feel super secure in my ears because of the flexible ear hook and you know I can hear cars coming. So if this sounds like something you've been looking for, then you gotta give it a try with the link below. They've got a 45 day risk free trial, free shipping, and a 2 year warranty. Pick yours up today by pausing the video and clicking the link below. Thanks to Shox for sponsoring this video. Francesca Gino is one of the most active behavioral science researchers in her field. Since 2007, she has published over 135 scientific articles. She's known for making these wild theories when it comes to human behavior, and yet somehow, her experiments always seem to confirm these wild theories, which has made her one of the most famous scientists of our times. But all of this success has made a lot of people skeptical of her work. In their opinion, Gino's theories and results have always been a little bit too good to be true, but no one could figure out why. That was until Joe Simmons, Leif Nelson, and Uri Simonson, three business school professors from other universities, decided to do a little digging into her research to find out if she was actually the real deal. And it didn't take long for these three investigators to find some startling irregularities. In 2012, Gino and four other well-known researchers published a report on a study about honesty. In the study, they were trying to figure out how to make people more honest. And here's how it worked. A group of students were brought in and given a worksheet with 20 math puzzles on it. They were offered $1 for each puzzle they got right within 5 minutes. But here was the catch, is that the students were allowed to grade themselves, and then they were allowed to shred their worksheets so no one would be able to check if they lied or not about how many answers they got right. The idea was to make students think that they could cheat and get away with it. Once they had shredded their worksheets, each student was given another form to report the amount of money they had earned from the puzzles they solved. The only difference in the study was that some other students got a form with an honesty pledge at the top, some other students got a form with an honesty pledge at the bottom, and some students got a form with no honesty pledge at all. What the people in the experiment don't know is that we played with the shredder. <laughs> Talk, talking about cheating. Um, <laughs> the shredder shred the sides of the page. So when you put the page in, it vibrates, it shakes, it makes a sound but the body of the page remains intact. <laughs> so we can find out how many questions people really solve correctly. Gino's theory was that if students signed the honesty pledge at the top of the form, it would make them more honest. And when the results came back, that's exactly what the study proved. 
While 79% of the students who signed at the bottom lied about the number of puzzles they solved, only about 37% of the students who signed at the top lied. So the honesty pledge at the top of the forum clearly worked. Gina wasn't just correct, she was wildly correct, achieving the highly sought after statistical significance. Statistical significance means that the results of your study are likely true and not due to chance. And at first thought, this theory kind of makes sense. But when you start to think about it, really? Signing a stupid pledge is going to double your chances of being honest? A person who is set on cheating is not going to cheat just because they signed the stupid pledge? It seems at least a little bit too good to be true, right? That's what the three investigators looking into Gino set to find out. So they took a closer look at the data and they noticed something was really off. Here's a spreadsheet of all the participants, and as you can see, these results are almost perfectly sorted by their participant ID, except for the few results highlighted in yellow. These results are completely random out of order, and one of the participants is even mentioned twice, participant number 49. Hmm, okay, that's a little weird. But what if someone just made a mistake when they were entering the data? That could be the case. But what's even more suspicious is that these entries also had the biggest effects on the results of the study. These suspicious entries all heavily skewed the results in favor of Gino's theory. Without them, her theory would not have any legs to stand on. There wouldn't be any statistical significance. And after examining the history of the Excel sheets, the investigator's suspicions were confirmed. Someone had indeed fudged the numbers. By changing a few lines in the spreadsheet, someone was able to turn what would have been a pretty lackluster study into something sensational. A study that would be published in top journals, that would be mentioned in the morning news, that would bring in loads of publicity, interviews, attention, and praise. And that someone was probably Francesca Gino. But there were a lot of people involved in the study. So how can we know for sure that it was her that fudged the numbers? Well, that is right. If this was the only case, it would be a little hard to prove that it was indeed her that did this. But those three investigators were just getting started. Francesca Gino was part of another study about honesty in 2015. This time, her theory was that arguing against something you believe in would make you feel dirty, and therefore it would increase your desire for cleaning products as a result. It seems like a pretty silly hypothesis, but think about it. If proven right, news stations from all over the country would be touting how Did you know that lying makes you more likely to buy cleaning products? Joining us now is Professor Francesca Gino, who just completed another landmark study saying just that. Maybe you can even do a TED talk on it. Ah yes, you can see it now, your name up in lights. So you did the study and magically, just like before, your theory was proven wildly right. As part of the study, around 500 students completed an online survey to express their opinion on a polarizing issue about Harvard. Then they were asked to write an essay that either argued for or against the opinion they just stated. After the essay, each student was asked to rate how desirable they found five different cleaning products. And as expected, a ton of more students who argued against their beliefs ended up finding the cleaning products more desirable compared to the honest group. And once again, the difference between these two groups was massive. Gino's theory was proven correct beyond a reasonable doubt. She had once again achieved statistical significance. Until our three investigators sourced the original data online. And just like in the first study, some of the data seemed a little fishy. As part of the study, students were asked to answer three simple demographic questions. One of the questions asked for the student's year in school, and that's where things got a little weird. Obviously, there are a lot of ways you can answer this question. Students could have written senior or junior, or they could have put they were in the class of 2015 or something. Or they could have just put the number of years they had been at Harvard. All these answers would have made perfect sense, but the investigators came across something strange. Grouped together in just 35 rows, a bunch of students had apparently just answered Harvard. Hey, what year of school are you in? Oh, Harvard. It made zero sense. And there was no way so many students could get such an easy answer so wrong, especially not Harvard students. So the investigators took the suspicious results and plotted them on a graph. And just like before, all those fishy entries were also some of the most extreme entries that skewed the results in favor of her theory. It was obvious that someone had gone back into the original results, deleted the information for a few students, and then re-entered data that would support their hypothesis. And maybe as they were doing this, they had forgotten what the last question was and just entered Harvard instead. And once again, it was Francesca Gino who had published the final results of the study online. Professor Gino was looking more and more guilty by the minutes. But even with two obvious cases as good as proven, our three investigators still had one trick up their sleeves. For the next study, our three investigators didn't even have to go far to find the original data, because Gino has sent them the data herself just a few years ago. This time, Gino and her fellow researchers hypothesized that people who are dishonest are more creative than those who aren't. 
To test their theory, they created a simple online experiment. Around 180 participants would be presented with a virtual coin toss, and then they would be asked to predict whether the coin would show heads or tails when it lands. For every correct guess, they would be paid $1. Just like the first study, this gave participants an easy opportunity to cheat and make more money. But little did they know that the researchers would be able to see the number of times each participant had cheated. After the coin toss exercise, the participants were asked to list out as many uses for a newspaper as possible in one minute. The more creative the participant was, the more uses they would be able to think of for the newspaper. By now, you can probably guess what the results were. The participants who cheated ended up being more creative by a long run. And again, Professor Gino's theories were proven right. But with the original data at their fingertips, it didn't take our three investigators long to spot another set of suspicious results. In the Excel sheet, the results have first been sorted according to who had cheated and who hadn't, and then by the number of uses they could find for a newspaper. And just like before, the investigators found a whole bunch of entries that seemed completely out of order. As if someone had gone back and changed the number of newspaper uses so the results looked more dramatic. And just like before, the investigators were proven right. Each of the altered results was there to inflate the data. And when you change those suspicious results back to the numbers they should have been, according to where they were sorted on the sheets, there was actually no difference between the cheaters and the non-cheaters' creativity. Francesca Gino had done it again. But Gino wasn't going to go down without a fight. In the fall of 2021, our three investigators compiled a full report on their findings and suspicions based on those four studies of Geno's, and they sent it to the Harvard Business School for review. Harvard would have a lot more access and insights into the studies Geno had done, and they would be able to figure out pretty easily if someone had changed the results. The investigators suspected that there were a lot more studies than just those four as well, and apparently they weren't wrong. Harvard's internal report on what happened was more than 1,200 pages long. That's a lot of pages for just four studies. As a result, Francesca Gino was put on unpaid administrative leave, and her four studies were retracted. But Gino wasn't going to take these accusations lying down. Instead, she's suing these three professors and Harvard University for at least $25 million, arguing that this was all defamation. But she made one small mistake. With the details of her lawsuit made public, we now know that Harvard's investigation found solid proof that she had been altering the results herself. For at least one of the studies, the original and manipulated Excel sheets had been created and last saved by Gino herself, proving without a doubt that she was the one responsible. So if you're going to be like Professor Gino and fake your results to gain more status, at least put a little bit of effort into modifying your spreadsheet, at least copy and paste your data over to a fresh new Excel sheet so that the history is clean. And I know what you're thinking, but Jake, it's pretty easy to fake stuff in the soft sciences like behavioral science. But what about the hard sciences like physics and biology? There's no way you can commit research fraud with that. Well, you would be sadly mistaken. This is Mark Tessier Levine, the president of Stanford University. He's one of the most well-known and respected academics in the world, and he has also just been accused of research fraud. Mark is a neuroscientist who's famous for his work in the 90s that studied how brain cells work. His research had massive implications for doctors trying to treat Alzheimer's, and building on that, he worked himself up through the ranks, eventually becoming president of Rockefeller University in 2011, and then the president of Stanford in 2016. But Mark's career had not always been a smooth climb to the top. Over and over again, people pointed out issues with the research he published. And by the time he became president of Stanford, rumors of malpractice in his lab had been swirling around for years. But here's the thing, despite all these accusations, Mark had become a massive figure in the academic community. Accusing him without solid proof would be career suicide. So even though plenty of people had their suspicions, no one ever had the guts to investigate him. Until now. What's even crazier is that the person that exposed Mark wasn't some professor or researcher. No, it was an 18-year-old Stanford freshman named Theo Baker. Theo was part of the university's student-run newspaper, the Stanford Daily. And in 2022, he made it his mission to do what people twice his age have been too scared to try for years. He would take on one of the most powerful scientists in the world. With the help of Elizabeth Bick, a biologist and scientific fraud investigator, Theo started digging into Mark's most questionable studies, and what he found was close to unbelievable. Without going into too many details of the complicated research Mark's labs conducted, Theo and Elizabeth discovered that much of the photographic evidence had been shamelessly altered. And when I say shamelessly, I mean shamelessly. Like here, where the results in the purple and green squares are repeated in photos for a totally separate experiment, meaning they just copy and paste a photo from one experiment to another. 
or like here where the contents of the yellow and green squares have obviously been copied and used to cover something up. The manipulations got so out of hand that in one study, they literally reused the exact same photo but just artificially enlarged it to show a neuron growing. Like it's literally the same photo just zoomed in a bit. Theo Baker published his findings in 2022 and it caused chaos in the scientific community. The president of one of the best universities in the world was a liar and a fraud. But just like Francesca Gino, Mark would not go down without a fight. And unlike her, he had Stanford University on his side. Turn up the volume for this one. Last week, we told you about the president of Stanford University announcing he would be stepping down. It is because of questions about some of his past research. Those questions were first brought into the spotlight by the student paper, the Stanford Daily. And our next guest is the student journalist who broke that story, Theo Baker. Almost as soon as Theo Baker's findings were published, Stanford University went into damage control. They announced an investigation into Mark's work. They also quickly made a statement saying that most of the manipulated research had no effect on the study's results. Stanford didn't want to tarnish their prestigious reputation, so they played down Mark's involvement. When the investigation ended after eight months, the official report was that Mark had done nothing wrong. It said that there was no evidence that Mark himself had been involved in manipulating the data or that he knew about the fraudulent data either. Ah yes, an institution tasked with investigating itself finds itself not guilty. What a surprise. But even if Mark wasn't the one that did it, Mark was still listed on each of these studies as a co-author. And usually co-authors are really involved in writing and reviewing the reports before they're published. People have pointed out issues with Mark's work in 2001, the early 2010s, 2015, 2016, and even 2021. And not once had he made any attempt to correct these mistakes. Because why would he? As president of Stanford, he was making a whopping $1.5 million a year and another $700,000 as a director of a biotech company called Regeneron. Him becoming the president of the Stanford University is basically the equivalent of a political science student eventually becoming the president of the country. He was at the top and he was not going to risk giving that up. In July 2023, Mark announced that he would be resigning as Stanford's president and he would be retracting at least three of his papers. And even though it was obvious why he was resigning, he made sure to tell everyone that it had nothing to do with these accusations and that he only resigned because he believed Stanford needed a leader that wasn't shrouded in all these false accusations. Thanks to Stanford's support, Mark got off easy and he won't even be leaving the university completely. He will stay on as a faculty member while also keeping a spot as a director of Regeneron. Science is viewed as this infallible thing, that science can't be corrupted, trust in the science they say. But at the end of the day, scientists are still humans. And as humans, who could say no to the publicity, the recognition, the tenureship at a great university so you can have job security for the rest of your life? Especially when cheating is oh so easy. We would hope to think that Francesca and Mark were the only prominent academics to have cheated, but let's be real, these are just the two that actually got caught. So who knows how many other fraudulent studies there are out there that we have shaped society around that have not been exposed. Stay dangerous and we'll see you in the next one.